Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you for coming to Flatiron School's iHeart Data Week. Today, we're doing the Freakonomics of Big Data, Pop versus Soda versus Coke, the debate that will go on and on and on. My name is Corey Mickelson. I am the event coordinator here with Flatiron School. A big part of my job is hosting free webinars like today's event to give you all the opportunity to meet some of our instructors um, and our faculty managers and get a better feel of the Flatiron School experience. A quick reminder, we're using the chat for our main source of communication. Feel free to message each other on there, drop any LinkedIn social handles you want to share to build community and for networking. Um, so make sure you set that little blue button at the bottom from host and panelists to everyone so we can all chat together. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our host for today, Greg D'Amico. Um, they are the technically technical faculty manager here for data science uh, at Flatiron School. Go ahead and take it away, Greg. Okay, thanks, Corey. Appreciate that. Hello, everybody out there in TV land. Good to see you all. So uh, what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about pop and soda and Coke. Now, what the heck does that have to do with with Freakonomics. Well, a word about sort of the overarching theme here of, of Freakonomics. Um, first of all, I think this is a fantastic uh, and rich vein of materials for, for things like this, talks and webinars and other data science types of projects. Um, lots of different lessons to be learned from Freakonomics, really interesting and important stuff that you can pull out of there. Also, it happens to be a really sort of uh, uh, major force in popular culture. It's sort of worked its way into sort of the mainstream uh, environment. There's now two books. There are books about the books. There's a podcast. I believe there's a weekly blog. Um, and people just seem to be, you know, sort of really excited about, about the Freakonomics um, material. So... There's, again, a couple lessons we might draw from Freakonomics. Um, I'm not going to try to cover them all, of course. Um, one of the lessons you might draw has to do with um, data about human behavior, right? So one of the big lessons from the book is uh, when you're working with data that has to do with human behavior, you have to keep in mind information about people's incentives, Right. And how, how are people acting? Probably they're going to act in the ways in which they have incentives to act, right? Or not in the ways that they have disincentives to act. Um, but what I want to focus on here, for example, is um, a different sort of lesson that comes from free economics, which has to do with correlation. Okay. So if I say the word correlation, um, what do what do you all think about? What does that mean to you, correlation? Just go ahead and drop in the chat there. John says, an event leading to a result. Good. Uh-huh. Anything else? Relationship? Yeah. Good. So here we have a kind of picture of what correlation might look like. And basically what we're talking about is, well, we have two things that can vary, two variables, right? Strength of the relationship between variables, good. Dangerous temptation to describe causality, good, right? We have two variables, and it often happens that variables co-relate, correlate. That is, one goes up as the other goes up, or one goes down as the other goes up. They move together. And as David is pointing out in the chat, um, <clears throat> the, it, there's an extremely natural human temptation when observing this to think that there's some kind of simple causal story that explains this, right? Why is it that A and B seem to change together? Well, maybe A is the cause of B, right? And this is probably a good and natural assumption to make in certain contexts. So for example, if we notice that, say, uh, housing prices tend to go up when population densities in a city tend to go up, right? Well, in all probability, it is the increase in population density that is causing, at least in part, the uptick in housing prices, right? But on the other hand, 
right? Sometimes we observe correlations and we think that actually there is no causal story to tell there at all. Or if there is, it's far more complex than the simple story that A causes B or that B causes A, right? It may, for example, be that there's some third thing, C, that's responsible causally for both A and B. Or we can imagine all sorts of other more exotic causal stories uh, that actually explain what's going on. And sometimes you come across a correlation that seems to have no plausible causal story behind it at all. So for example, uh, some student noticed, I think this person was in England, I think, um, some student noticed that uh, there seems to be a correlation between the number of movies uh, that Nicolas Cage appears in coming out in a year and the number of drownings in swimming pools that same year, right? Why should it be that when more Nicolas Cage movies come out, there are more drownings that year? Why should it be that when there are fewer Nicolas Cage movies, there are fewer drownings? And you think, you sort of rack your brain and you think, well, surely there's no, there's no causal story here at all, right? It can't be that, uh, you know, the mere fact of Nicolas Cage movies coming out makes people want to go drown themselves in pools. That doesn't make sense, right? And so this seems to be a kind of, you know, spurious correlation. It seems to be a kind of correlation without any kind of causal substance under it. Now, you might think, you might think that's a very strange thing, but it's really not so strange. Here's a sort of Freakonomic kind of thought. Well, think about all the ways in which variables could potentially correlate with each other, right? That is, think about all the many different variables out there. How many variables are there in the world, right? Well, there are, I don't know, millions, billions, trillions of variables. One variable is, you know, the average, uh, you know, length, average growth of antlers among female reindeer in Finland in 2022. And another variable is, you know, um, average salt intake by children ages 11 to 15 in the state of Pennsylvania for 2022, right? I mean, if you sort of think about how many variables there are, right, it's hard even to quantify that. There's, there's just sort of millions upon millions or probably trillions of variables. And now you might say, well, look, if I just pick two variables, anything at all, right, if I just pick two of those at random, the chance that there's some correlation between them is really very small, right? But on the other hand, if I consider all possible pairs of variables that might correlate with each other, even though each pair has a very small chance of correlating, right? The chance that I actually go in and look at all of them and find that there's no correlation between any pair, that is actually very, very unlikely. Right. And so we start to notice that actually you are likely to find some weird correlations every now and then. Okay. Nicholas Cage movies and drownings and pools. Maybe that's just one of those, one of those cases. Okay. But now to the case at hand, right? What I want to talk about is pop versus soda versus Coke. Some people have other words for soft drinks. And what I want to do is I want to see if there's a correlation between how people are inclined to speak. So this is just a, you know, a fact about English dialects in, in the United States. Is there some correlation between how people speak and where they're from, right? And so what I'm really asking about now is whether there's a kind of spatial correlation. Is there a correlation between the way people speak and where they are in space, right? One of my variables is space, as it were. And so for that, you can imagine that th this sort of representation of correlation, whether positive or zero or negative, this isn't really gonna work, right? Because now I need to represent space as one of my dimensions. And so what I'm thinking about is something more like this, okay? So here, this is the kind of representation of what we, what we mean when we're thinking about spatial correlation. So think about, you know, blue versus white, and, you know, pop versus soda or whatever as sort of the variable of interest. If there's a spatial correlation between blue and white, 
right? Then we expect to see something like, well, this is a positive correlation, something like we see in A, right? The blues are sort of in one corner, the whites are sort of in another corner, okay? That is, there's a correlation between, right, where we find the blues and where we find the whites. The blues sort of cluster, the whites sort of cluster. If there's a negative spatial correlation, right, <clears throat> notice no two white areas touch each other, no two blue areas touch each other. We're, we're not going to count corners as, as bordering. Okay. So this in the middle is negative correlation. And then over here, C, well, this is zero correlation, right? Some of the blue areas touch each other, some of the white areas touch each other, but there's no, there's no sort of clear pattern here. This is analogous to right, analogous to zero correlation in the in the normal case. Okay. okay, so how am I going to address this question of whether there's a correlation between, you know, English behavior, pop versus soda or whatever, and uh, spatial location in the United States? Well, Really what I need is, of course, some data, okay? Preferably the results of some poll, right? What I really want is, I want people to tell me, A, where they're from, and B, what word they use for soft drinks, okay? So I happen to have, there happens to be online, a nice little data set right here, okay? This is, notice this is at a website called popversussoda.com. Who even knew there was a pop versus soda.com, but there it is. Okay. And we have here information about how people use these words and where they're from. Okay. We just have a sort of bare count. How many people, you know, say this word, how many people say that word. Okay. Notice we have pop, soda, coke, and other. Okay. And then we have a total here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into a a Jupyter notebook here. Well, this is actually a notebook that I'm running on Google Colab, and we'll make sure that you have access to this uh, to this notebook. Um, so uh, there's one package I need to install here. This is called PySal, and this is going to help us do our our spatial analysis here. Okay. Now, the first thing I need to do is I need to get that data from off the web and into my into my workspace here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a program called Beautiful Soup, a package called Beautiful Soup, and another package called Requests. Requests is going to access this location on the web, and Beautiful Soup is going to help me to parse the HTML on that page so that I can find the data that I want. Okay, more on that in a second. So I'm just going to bring in these tools here. Okay. <clears throat> so for those who haven't seen code like this before, this is just, this is Python code. And, um, you know, one of the many reasons why Python is so good for data science is precisely because of this cell that I just ran, namely that there are all these wonderful little packages that I can bring into my workspace and, and, do all sorts of interesting things with conduct uh, conduct statistical text tests, do some other data type data analysis, do some plotting. So we're going to use a package called Plotly to do some plotting, um, do some quick scientific computing calculations, access the web, all sorts of things. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to grab the URL of this of this data table here just going to encode that in a string. And then I'm going to say, hey, requests package, go get the content from that web page. It looks like everything is working. Okay, the status code 200 just means that the connection has been made. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take the content of that web page and I'm going to throw that into my beautiful soup package. This is the package that will parse my HTML for me. Okay. Now, what I mean when I say that is, um, so if you want to examine the HTML on your own, you can go to this web page, And if you want to, you can come down here. So I'm going to say view developer, and I'm going to say inspect elements. Okay. <clears throat> you can do this with any web page. 
right? So here, what I have popping up on the right side of my screen here is the HTML code that's underlying this web page. Okay, so you can see there's a head and there's a body. And here, right, I've got, this is if you've done any HTML before, this is a header tag, right? Pop versus soda statistics. And indeed, right, that does look like on the, on the left, that does indeed look like pop versus soda statistics in a sort of header font. Okay, and then I've got various paragraphs under this. And of course, what I'm interested in is the data table here. And the data table happens to be inside of a couple of table tags. Okay, you can see I've got table up here, slash table down here. And that means that the table itself is in between. Right, And each one of these tags here, or pairs of tags, indicates a row in the table. You can see how as I scroll over the, the rows in the code on the right, the relevant row on the left is highlighted. Okay, So here I am hovering over the Arkansas row, for example. I don't know why I'm picking Arkansas, but what the heck, Arkansas. Okay, And if I dig further into this code of HTML, right, you can see, all right, there's my 154 for people who say pop in Arkansas, 347 who say soda, 1442 who say, co this is apparently a Coke state. Okay, so most people say Coke, but there are some, some other uh, votes here. And then I've got the total number and I've got a percentage of the total population here. Okay, cool. So what I need to do in my Python code now Right. What I need to do is I just need to say, hey, beautiful soup, my, my HTML parser, find that table. Okay. And then just go into each of the rows and pull out the text that's buried in, in that HTML code. Okay. So first of all, I'm just going to grab the, the column headers of the, um, yes, Kevin, I'll share this code. So this is just buried in a, in a, um, Python notebook, and I will we will share this out. Oh, I got a question about increasing the font size. Let me see. Can I do this? Uh, how about that? Okay. All right. I hope that hope that helps. Okay. So first of all, I'm just going to grab the column headers, and so let's run this. I'm just going to store those in a Python list. And so if I see my work here, there they are. I've got my column headers, pop, soda, coke, other, and total. Okay. Now, if you look at the actual web page here, let's get rid of the, let's get rid of the, the developer pain for a minute here. Um, yeah, I got a question about the link for this notebook file. Um, so it is, it is not um, on any particular web page. It's just in my Google Colab notebook. So let me, I can actually grab this again. Uh, so let me, we can drop this one more time. Just gonna download this one more time. All right. And let me drop this in the chat one more time. Oh, I guess I already had a copy of it. Okay. Okay. So if you if you um, upload this into Google Google Colab, which is colab.research.google.com, you can you can run the cells yourselves. Um, also, you could open this locally if you have um, some Python uh, notebook reader like Anaconda or something like that. Okay. Cool. Okay, so again, I was just going to point out that the, uh, oh, you can't copy the links in the chat. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, let's see. Let's see. Can I do this? Uh, so. Oh, let me see. Maybe I sent it to host. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's try this one more time. Okay, try that.
Okay, so back if we look back at our our actual page here, right? We see there's this um, final column that has a percentage of the total population, and there's no there's no header there for some reason. So I'm just gonna just gonna add one there. I'm just gonna call that percentage. Okay, so that's my new list of column headers. Okay, and now the hard work of grabbing everything else in this data table, right? So I'm just going to go through each of my table rows, and I'm going to find my table headers and then the, the uh, table data entries, and I'm going to throw them all into my collection here, okay? Nice and lightning fast. Okay, so... What I want to do now is I want to throw that data into a data frame so that I can see it and it's sort of easily uh, uh, viewable and I can work with it easily and so on. So I'm going to use a package called pandas and pandas is going to house this data that I just pulled off of the web. Okay, and so my data frame looks like this. Okay, great. Looks like I successfully pulled it down from the web there. Right, I've got my states. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these top two rows. I don't really need them. I'm just interested in the, the individual states. I don't need these totals here. Okay, so I'm going to drop those first two rows. And if I look at the shape of my data table here, my data frame, I see that I've got 69 rows. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And if I look again at this original data table, it's actually not just the 50 states. I've got some Canadian provinces in here. I'm going to end up dropping those and just focusing on the 50 states. Um, but just notice that they're in here for now. Okay. Okay. Looks good. There's my new data table. I've gotten rid of the top two rows. Um, I can save this to a CSV. I've already done that, so I'm going to skip over this cell for now. Now, one thing that that um, we notice here is that even though these look like numbers in here, which is what I'd like to have, um, I've actually got a bunch of strings. Okay, and this, this shows up as objects on my notebook here. So I need to convert these into numbers. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this cell here is for each of my columns, all right, I'm going to map the, the entry to an integer. And for the last one, the percentage, I'm going to map that to a float. Okay, so I'm going to divide it by 100 to get an actual decimal and map that to a float. Okay, so let's do that. Okay. Now I've got integers and floats. That looks much better. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so what I want to do next, I think, so I think in order to get a good sense of this data, what I'd like to do is to plot it, right? And ideally, I'd like to plot this on a US map so that I can see sort of numbers by state very clearly, okay? Now, the Plotly package has a nice way of doing this. But the Plotly package needs the, um, the standard postal abbreviations for my states here. Okay, so you can see in my original data here, I've just got this state names written out long form, Alabama, Alaska, et cetera. So I need to convert these. So I'm going to borrow this, uh, this dictionary here, which maps my state names into their postal codes. Okay. So I'm going to give myself this dictionary, and then I'm going to use that dictionary to convert my names in my in my data table. Okay, so that's what I did there. And if I want to see what it now looks like, let's just take a sample of my data frame. Whoops, and I made that code a text cell instead of a code cell. Let me just grab this. Okay. 
and you can see there, right now I've got my postal abbreviations in there. Cool. Okay, so let's get to the good stuff. Let's see what this actually looks like. So I'm going to use what's called a choropleth map here and map my data. Okay. Great. So this is what my pop data looks like by state. Okay. And probably not too surprising if you know anything about uh, this, you know, curious fact about English dialects in America. Pop is sort of dominated in the Midwest here, not very common in the South, not very common in the West, and so on. Okay. But now it occurs to me that I can do a little bit better here, right? Because if I look back at my original data, well, I've just got pure population numbers in there. Right? If I look back at my original my original data here, right, I just have raw numbers as though of responses to a quiz or a poll or something like that. And in particular, there's no sort of normalization to account for the fact that some states have much larger populations than other states, right? So for example, you know, I've got uh, 60 people in American Samoa, I've got 800 people in Hawaii, I've got 11,000 people in Florida, et cetera. Right? David's asking about how we ended up with a uh, state whose postal code was NAN. NA, that's a good question. NAN stands for not a number. And so you see it right there. And what happened here, David, is um, there were um, areas in my original data that have no correlate in this in this dictionary. Right? So this dictionary that I used to map my data, is only the 50 states. And so things that were outside of that didn't get mapped to anything. And so that, that sort of confused my, my uh, interpreter here about what to put there. It doesn't really matter ultimately because we're gonna focus on the 50 states, but this, this must have been one of the original um, pieces of data that was not from one of the 50 states. Okay. So I've got these raw numbers, and what I really probably ought to do is think about percentages, right? I don't really care about the raw number of people in Ohio who, who use the word pop, right? A better measure of, of English usage in these states would be what the percentage is, right? What's the percentage of people in Ohio who use the word pop? What's the percentage of people in Alabama who use the word Coke or whatever? Okay, so that's easy enough. I'm just going to create those, those columns in my data table. So I'm just gonna take my pop number and divide by total, soda number and divide by total, Coke and divide by total. Probably not gonna worry about other, but I'll go ahead and construct an other percentage as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna add those. Now I think these maps will be more telling. So let's now look at pop usage and soda usage and Coke usage, and this time based on percentages. Okay. Notice the difference between my new pop map here and my old pop map. Right. This has lots of blue areas. Notice the blue is sort of lowish numbers. Of course, the yellow is all the way up at 20,000. But we know that Right, a lot of these states, so you can see 586 people in Arizona, 95 people in New Mexico, right? This is obviously swayed by just the facts of populations in the, in the U.S. states. Whereas here, right, now I've standardized the scale here. I'm only going from zero up to one, i.e. 0% to 100%. And so I've got a better sort of metric of how pop the word is used in each of these states. Okay, and you can see here, right? Well, you tell me, I guess. What do you what do you see here? What should we take away from this map about about pop usage? What what do you take away? Uh, 
Any thoughts? Do you see your home state on there? M. Mal says it's a north central thing. Yeah. Further south, the less the word pop is used. Yeah. Yeah. These are good, good observations. Minnesotans like pop. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I happen to be originally from the state of Ohio, and um, Ohio is a pretty pop happy place. I would say, hey, mom, can I have a pop when I was, you know, 14 or whatever. 83% um, in Ohio, 84% in Minnesota. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, you can't talk like that in New York. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jonathan says it's not a perfect correlation geographically. Yeah, good. I think that's an important thing to notice too, right? This is not a sort of binary plot here. This is not black and white, or as it were, yellow and blue, right? Pop is concentrated in the northern states, specifically in the Midwest. Yeah, good. Okay, so yellow are sort of clear states, which is pretty, you know, pretty uh, obviously the Midwest, although Wisconsin is kind of an outlier here. Who knows why Wisconsin is only 27%. Um, one might wonder about, you know, the, the quality of our data. Um, you know, this is obviously a question lurking in the background is how good our data is. Um, but, you know, we'll just let that go for now. Uh, Barbara says Wisconsin calls it soda. Okay. All right. Maybe so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Edward points out that there can be variations inside of states, right? We are limited by the sort of resolution of our of our data here. <clears throat> so if we wanted to, we could try to zoom in and say, look at maybe county by county, right? instead of just state by state. There's 50 states. There's, I forget, I think there's on the order of you know several thousand counties in, in the United States. Um, we could try for more detail. And um, you know, Pennsylvania seems to be one of these states where, you know. We get, when you get a number like 50%, 52%, right? We'd like to try to try to get more clarity on that. Probably what's happening, and in fact, you know, having grown up not far away, I, I know this, that there's a lot of pop sayers in the Western part, as makes sense, right? The sort of more, the more Midwestern-y part of Pennsylvania, whereas in the East, they align themselves more with sort of the East Coast and New York, and so they they speak otherwise in the East, right? Okay, so that's something we might think about if we wanted to improve this in the future. But let's um, let's go on for now. Let's take a look also at soda. Okay. Soda percentages look like that. Okay, what do you notice here? Anything anything jump out at you here? Who says soda? Charles says California. David says more intermediate values. Yeah, there are more intermediate values. Yeah, Maine. So it looks like New England, there's a lot of soda people. Okay. Wisconsin and Missouri remain odd. Yeah, show me the soda. Nice. Yeah, Missouri, seventy-one percent, pretty high. Okay. Northeast and west. Yeah, I think northeast and west is a good sort of summary. Um, Washington and Oregon. You know, maybe we're a little confused up here. That again, these might be states that have sort of regional differences within them. California seems to be um, a soda state. I actually spent. A number of years in California, and I sort of had to train myself to start saying soda instead of pop. Um, sometimes I don't know what to say anymore. Washington up here, we're we're all sort of confused. Sometimes I just say soda pop, and people look at me like I'm like I'm nuts. But anyway, that's American English for you. All right, northeast and west. What part of the country is left? We haven't said much about the deep south. And if you look at the Coke percentages. Right, you can see that, aha, right, that's kind of a deep south thing. 
Mississippi leading the way here at 80%, Alabama is 67%. Um, most of the rest of the country looks at this and says, well, that's very strange. Why would you say you want a Coke if what you really want is a Sprite or whatever? But there are plenty of populations here that do use the word Coke in this in that generic way there. Um, yeah, Edward points out that the headquarters of Coca-Cola is in Atlanta, and that that's that might be very relevant here. Yeah, what are the sales percent? Do people actually buy a Pepsi and the do they refer to Pepsi as Coke? I think I think they probably do, but I I don't know. Good question. Okay, so I want to get to the the finale here, which is I want to look officially in some, you know, statistically uh, uh, responsible way, I want to look for spatial correlations. And I certainly seem to be seeing them. Right, this is what my map suggests, but I want to test for them a little more carefully. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to experiment with a statistic called Moran's eye. Okay, Moran's eye. And in effect, right, what this does is it looks for correlations of the sort that we're looking at up here in this image here. How do you do that, right? Well, the basic idea is let's consider which areas border each other, right? And let's look at the variable of interest in those states that border each other and compare it to the variable of interest in states that do not border each other, okay? Um, that's that's the big idea okay and so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to try to test for this and in order to do this i need to explain to my python interpreter here which states border each other and which ones do not right notice right i can see that in my maps here but that's not really in my data as such and so what i need is a new data file here and so i'm going to upload this this new data file here that has uh, that information about boundaries in it, okay? And I'm loading this into uh, my workspace here with a package called GeoPandas. Okay, GeoPandas, geography pandas. So pandas is a common, um, you know, data analysis tool. GeoPandas is for data that has this kind of spatial or geographical component to it. And if I look at my my data frame here that I've just uploaded, well, there's some weird stuff in here. You can see that I've still got the state abbreviations. And on the far right here, I've got this column that says things like polygon and multi-polygon. Right? This is the column that has information about the geometry of my different states here, how they border. Right? So these numbers refer to latitudes and longitudes. Okay. Cool. Okay, so once again, I'm going to forget about uh, things that are not the 50 states for now. I realize that's sort of American-centric, but just for uh, simplicity, I'm just going to worry about those. So I'm just going to drop the other things. Okay, so there I'm down to 50 rows. My row indexing start at zero, so the last row is number 49. Okay. Now, how do I determine the neighbors of my states? Well, I just need to choose some way of determining this. And much like my picture up here with the chessboard, right? what I want to do is I want to count states that share an edge as bordering, and I'm not going to count states that come only together at a corner as bordering. Right? There is one place in particular in the United States where four states come together like this. I'm not going to count them as bordering. Probably this is not going to have a huge influence on, on um, my data because, again, there's only one place like this. But what I'm doing is called the rook method. Right? And if you, if you know chess and you think about the way a rook moves on a chessboard, right, the rook can move vertically or horizontally, not diagonally. And so the rook method is a way of 
measuring which states count as bordering and which states do not, right? Which states count as neighbors, okay? So I'm going to use my ESDA package and I'm going to go in there and I'm gonna grab this Rook weighting and I'm going to apply that to my data here, okay? <clears throat> this thing stores information about the neighbors. In fact, it stores it in an attribute called neighbors. And so I might want to sort of make sure that I've got the right thing here. So I'm just going to create a little test to make sure this worked. Alaska, which is going to be state number one, Alabama is state number zero, right? They're in alphabetical order. Alaska borders no states, right? So, I sh so it should have no bordering states listed. Alabama, state number zero. Let's see, that border is number Florida, uh, uh, Florida, which is state number eight, Georgia, which is state number nine. Mississippi, which is state number 23, and Tennessee, which is state number 41, okay? So let's just see if that's what we see when we run this code. Okay, so here's Alabama right here, and its set of neighbors are 8, 41, 9, and 23. That's exactly what we said. State number one is Alaska, and that has an empty list because it doesn't border any other state, okay? Cool. Okay, once again, I've got a few non-states in here, so I'm going to get rid of those. Okay, and I'm going to reset my index. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to calculate what are called local indicators of spatial association, LISA. Okay, LISA is the helpful acronym here. And the idea is, right, um, I might notice some clustering in around verbal behavior in certain states and maybe not so much in other states. Right, so that's what I'm going to calculate here. This is basically just like any other sort of hypothesis test. There's a null hypothesis that says that there is no correlation. The alternative hypothesis says that there is. And so I'm looking for low p-values and so on. It's going to give me a little caution here that it's got a couple islands, right? Alaska and Hawaii are islands in the relevant sense here. Okay, having no borders. If I actually want to see the local values of Moran's I, I can see them here. Okay, it's not those numbers are probably not super interesting on their own. The p values are more interesting. So here are my pop p values. Okay, 50 of them, one for each state. And the idea is, right, the lower the p value, the more certain we are that there is in fact some spatial correlation here, right? The more certain we are that the numbers we see in the state and its neighbors aren't just a matter of chance, but rather are a reflection of some clustering in the linguistic behavior of the people in those states, okay? Now we can choose whatever cutoff we like. Um, 0.05 is a typical cutoff. 0.001 is almost certainly going to be significant no matter what we choose. Right, point, uh, you know, point one four is probably not so significant. Uh, you know, point three six four is definitely not significant. Right, so we definitely see different numbers here across the board. Here are my p values for soda and my p values for coke. Okay, and so what I want to do finally now is just to plot these significant values on a map and compare the relevant states to the maps that I had above, which I'll, which I'll plot again down here. Okay, so let's start with pop. I'm borrowing some code here. Um, and this is just going to show me a, a plot of where my pop numbers are significant. Right? So it's just going to color in the states that have significant p-values. My cutoff is 0.05. Okay, and it looks like this. So I see some significant pop clustering, sort of Midwest, Northeast, right? And if I reprint my, um, if I reprint my map here from before, right? There's my pop percentages. Notice that, right? Well, sometimes the clustering corresponds with where pop is used a lot. So like in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, there's a lot of pop usage there. 
but sometimes the clustering corresponds with where pop is not used very much at all. So for example, in the deep south, right, there's spatial correlation there. And that's not because a lot of people say pop, but because a lot of people don't say pop down here, right? And then in large chunks of the country, so west coast down to Texas, all of this is not significant, right? And so that means that it's not clear that there's any spatial correlation over here in the western part of the country, which makes sense, right? Because I see some blues, but I also see some pinks and some purples and oranges, right? Oregon, you know, unsurprisingly, Oregon is not a significant clustering state because it's surrounded by Washington and Idaho, which are similar, but Nevada and California are quite different. Right? And those are the neighbors of Oregon. Okay, we can do the same thing for soda. There's my significant clustering around usage of the term soda. And here's my soda map from before, just as a reminder. Okay, so again, here there's high clustering and high usage. But down here in Texas, for example, there's high clustering and low usage. Okay, so there's spatial correlation here among people in the South as far as not using the word soda for their soft drinks. And we can also do the same with Coke. Okay, different map again. Here's our Coke map from before. Okay, unsurprisingly, spatial correlation among the deep south states here. They have, uh, you know, they all seem to speak the same way when it comes to Coke and using it generically, whereas the rest of the country, you know, treats it like the brand name. Okay. So that's a little intro to the sort of thing we might do when we're interested in conducting this kind of spatial analysis. Um, how does you know, the usage of the term pop or soda or Coke correlate to place in the country? Well, it seems to correlate quite well, actually. Okay, so we will leave it there. Thanks very much. Um, I'm happy to take questions if you have them. See some things coming in the chat here. Jonathan says, is it possible with Python to pull from multiple data sets and sources as long as you have a common key, such as Pennsylvania, to output them? Yes, yes, yes. So it's um, you can basically bring in as many data sources as you need. Um, and if there is no common key, you can always create one. Right? So you can shove data sets together and make a new table um, and then you'll have everything together. Okay. Sometimes neighboring states reinforce the data, other times it does not. Yeah, would be interesting to correlate with voting patterns, education. Yeah, I think there's lots of potential here. Um, you know, it's not surprising in general that there are spatial correlations uh, in the United States for how people behave, right? I mean, we the, the mere fact that we talk about the Deep South or New England or the West Coast, right? That already sort of suggests that there are patterns of behavior that are common to people across states and so on. Um, quick reminder of how p-value is obtained from neighbors. Yeah, so the, the, this is a little bit complicated. So I would invite you to, um, you know, what's my, my, one of my favorite resources is Wikipedia, even still. And Wikipedia actually happens to have a really nice article about Moran's eye statistic here. Um, so you can read about the, the um, how it's calculated here. But the basic idea, Barbara, is that you want to sort of get a sense of, um, right, what does the value of, of the variable of interest look like here? And what does the value of the variable of interest look like in the neighbors, right? compare that to what does the value of the variable look like in the non-neighbors, right? And sort of do all these calculations for all my different areas. And the null hypothesis would represent a kind of zero correlation where, well, some of the neighbors would be similar, but some of the non-neighbors would be similar, some of the neighbors would be dissimilar, et cetera. Right? That's, that's sort of the idea. Can I make the browser tab text bigger? Yeah, yeah, I think I can. Okay. Anything else? Let's see. 
Any other, any other questions or thoughts? Okay, well, we can go. Oh, there we go. Jonathan says, we understand some of what the Python code in the demo was, but not all. Would you think we'd be in position zero? Oh, yes, absolutely. I was expecting that most people wouldn't understand most of it at all. Um, you know, the, the code is important, but it's, it's you know, what I was caring more about here was what it can do. Um, obviously, if you sign up, then you're gonna you're gonna care about the code itself, um, but if you're already getting some of it, that's that's great. Yeah. How well? Oh well. So you know, officially speaking, we assume um, you know not much familiar with with the tools that we're going to be teaching you right um so web scraping is a topic in our in our course um using uh some of these other tools like pandas that is a big topic in our course so most of these tools you know it's great if you have some familiarity already with them but a lot of that a lot of that would be part of part of your um the content of the course itself Yes, about what do the what do we do with the um, with the data file? The data file, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, the data file itself is actually just a big JSON file. Um, so you can you can look at it that way. That's probably not ideal, right? Really, what you want is um, some reader of notebooks. So the easiest way to go is probably just to do what I did, which is to go to colab.research.google.com. This is called Google Colab. <clears throat> and you can, you can just upload this file and it will appear as it does here, right? So this file that you're looking at, that really is the, I, the IPYNB file that we, we sent out to you. It doesn't look like it, um, but this is this, website here is designed to display notebooks like that. Um, it is also possible to display these notebooks um, locally. So if you get a, um, a Python tool like Anaconda, Anaconda comes with Jupyter notebooks and you can display those notebooks with that tool on your own machine. Can I resend? Let's do it one more time. So, I will also send um, a link with the follow up email um, that will come with the recording of today's lesson for anybody that had to leave early or maybe you arrived a little late. Okay, well. Thank you again. It looks like we're at one o'clock. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Greg, for an amazing presentation and getting to the bottom of that soda versus pop versus Coke debate. Um, if you have any further questions about Flatiron School, I dropped a link to schedule a chat with admissions. I also dropped a couple links in there for our next two data science events. We have one to close out our, our iHeart Data Week tomorrow, <laughs> which is popping the AI bubble behind TikTok recommendations. Um, and then we're also starting off March, pre-March madness uh, for a bracket um, with machine learning. So bracket odds with machine learning. So both of those are in there as well. We'd love to see you at another event. And I hope you all have an amazing afternoon. Thank you again for joining. And we'll have the recording out to you in the next couple of business days. Bye.